right. This is introduction to incidence response. That's who I am, Gary Smith. I'm a cybersecurity analyst at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. That's my email. All right. What do cybersecurity professionals fear most of all? The Russians? <laughs> the Chinese? North Korea? Distributed denial of service? Ransomware? Malware? Phishing? Spear phishing? Whale phishing? Intruder alerts? Insiders? No. What we fear most of all is the 3 a.m. cell phone call. It's 3 a.m., you're sleeping peacefully, your cell phone goes off, it's your cybersecurity operations center. It's Charlie, who's your lead analyst on third shift, and he does his Jim Lovell imita imitation from Apollo 13. Houston, we've got a problem. That's what we fear. That's incidence response. When you get that call and you've got to get out of bed, you haven't had any coffee, and you've got to check something to see what's going on. That's incidence response. So, um, there's our agenda. Introduction, what is an incidence response team? The incidence response process and procedures some lessons we can learn from the military to help us with incidence response, the six stages of incidence response, types of security incidents, the cybersecurity kill chain, incidents types and recommended actions, tools, we love our tools, summary and some references. Okay, cybersecurity is not for the faint of heart. Our systems have gotten extremely complex, and they're getting more and more complex. Incidence response is about what happens when we think something has gone wrong, and we have to respond to it. Now, to do this, we have an incidence response plan, which is a whole other lecture. It's that's very dry and dull and boring about what you put into an incidence response plan. But this is more interesting because we're going to be talking about getting the right people, the right tools, the right processes, the right techniques in place to be able to respond when something goes bad. And it's not a question of if something goes bad, it is a question of when something goes bad. That's a depressing thought, I know, but eventually your company, your personal stuff, whatever, may get breached and you're going to have to do something about it. This is about what you can do up front as far as planning to take care of that inevitable situation. So. If you were going to describe what incident response is to a second grader, how would you describe that to them? It's something that they could understand, something that they know about. Well, incident response to a second grader is it's like a fire drill, but it's for IT people. And a fire drill, the second grader, well, they get herded up from their desk and they get herded outside, and it's kind of a fire drill, right? Things are a little bit chaotic. Well, when you have an incident, and you have to respond to it. It's sort of the same thing, except everybody's running around like their hair is on fire. Um, so, a more formal definition of incident response is, an incident response is an organized approach to addressing and managing the aftermath of a security breach or attack. What usually happens is, is that it is an in unorganized approach to addressing and mismanaging the aftermath of a security breach or attack. Um, case in point, Experian, one of the three credit agencies. Boy, was that a colossal disaster. Something very recent. Wipro, 
the big Indian outsourcing company. In March, Brian Krebs on his um, uh, website said, Repro has been compromised. Repro shot back that Brian Krebs is full of beans and we have not been compromised. <laughs> Sometime later, they said, well, we may have been compromised, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Sometime later yet, as in very recently, they said, well, we did get compromised, but it didn't really affect anybody's data. We, we've yet to see what chapter four on this is going to be like. <laughs> so, now the question comes up, if you're going to do incidence response, hopefully you've got some kind of incident response plan, and I've written several of those. But yes, you do need an incident response plan. Now, generally speaking, an incident response plan is like the oxygen masks in the airline. Something bad happens, those oxygen masks drop, you're supposed to put them on and breathe normally. Right. Breathe normally because you're going down into a nosedive. Okay. Right. But they usually just sit on the shelf. Hopefully they're getting updated at least once a year, maybe, if you're lucky. They're there for auditors. They're there for the executives to look at. But that has what you're supposed to do in what order, who to contact. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into an incident response plan. Um, as I said, I've written several in, in my career. Um, this is important to remember. Security is a subset of reliability because if your systems are reliable, they're going to be secure. They're not going to fall over when somebody comes knocking at the door with bad stuff. An incident response takes people. This is not something that you can buy an appliance for, stick it on your network, flip it on, make a few changes in a web GUI, and then walk away from it. Incidence response requires people, and it requires an incidence response team. Bruce Schneier, who's oftentimes referred to as Bruce the Beard, if you've ever seen a picture of him. Um, incidence response needs people because successful incidence response requires thinking. A box, an appliance, that's not going to do it for you. Um, it's also knowing it's having people that know what to do and when to do it. You really can't automate incident response. It's just impossible to do because everything, each instance, is going to be different. It requires thinking. It requires people to do this. And um, that's why you need to do upfront work on this. What does an instance response team do? Um, some people would say that they sit around, drink Mountain Dew, and eat pizza. Uh, that's not really, that, that's one view of it. That's what upper management thinks we do. But the incidence response team analyzes information. It discusses the observations that they make among themselves and shares that information across the company. Now, the lines at which that distribution of information across the company, that's usually left to upper levels. Um, but um, one of the major questions you need to ask when you get into this, and you think you have an incident, is, is this really a, a crisis? One of the things that I have on my whiteboard in my office is a, little, is a saying that says, never ascribe to maliciousness that which can be easily explained by stupidity. I think about that all the time. Because what you think may be wrongdoing is probably not. It's probably somebody doing something stupid. Um, Yes, the incident response team, when they're not doing incident response, they're out there honing their processes and getting better at it. 
the goal of an incident response team, both functions, investigation and analysis, reporting and communications, response and improvement. And that maps back to the previous slide. Okay. Who in here likes detective stories? Detective novels, detective movies, Sherlock Holmes, um, uh, Hercule Poirot, um, if you've ever read any of the French stuff, uh, Inspector McGray, um, you know, there, there's lots of detectives, detective work out there. Detective novels, detective movies, uh, TV shows. Instance response is detective work. You're trying to answer what I call the five W's plus H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those are the questions that you're trying to answer in incidence response. Um, okay. If you've ever watched or read any of those uh, uh, detective characters that I mentioned, as the story moves along, there's always false leads, red herrings, the detective goes down one path and then all of a sudden he gets that one piece of evidence that says, Oh, I've got it all wrong. This is the way it is. Same thing happens in instance response. You find dead ends, you find bad evidence, you find unreliable witnesses. Uh, Fred over in accounting, he says, No, I didn't click on that link. <laughs> yeah, right, Fred. Okay, your browser history tells me otherwise, but I'm going to overlook that fact. Um, yeah, it's just like being a detective. Okay. And there we are. Skills for instance response. Looking for common denominators, looking for common exceptions. Things that are the same, things that are the ordinary. That out of the ordinary stuff, we like to call that anomaly detection. That's a big buzzword. You can buy all sorts of things now for anomaly detection. As with any good detective, you make assertions. You don't make assumptions. That is something that Sherlock Holmes emphasizes over and over. I make deductions. I don't presume. Same thing. Again, going back to Sherlock Holmes. As he said, after you have eliminated all that is impossible, whatever is left, regardless of how improbable, must be the truth. That is the third one. You're eliminating the impossible. Get rid of the, all the things that are impossible that, will, that do not work. Arrive at the next thing. Look for a simpler solution. Albert Einstein said, a thing should be made as simple as possible but no simpler. Yeah, okay. But remember what I said. Never ascribe to malice that which can be easily explained by stupidity. Fred over in accounting clicked the wrong link. He downloaded some malware that downloaded a diskless uh, com command and control program, and now his laptop is trying to communicate with Lower Slobovia. Very important. Think like a hacker. Try breaking into your systems. If you can get permission for it, you may not. But think like a hacker. This will help you extend that security perimeter because you're looking for ways that they can get in before they get it. Okay. Who's on an incident response team? This is this is one formulation. There are others, but this is one way to do it. The response team leader. This is the central point for the incident response. He is working with the people who are sitting there at the terminal, or at the console, or at the windows, whatever. He is also talking to, they sometimes call them stakeholders, that's like his boss, upper management, he's running interference, trying to keep the CISO, the CIO, all those C people 
from talking to the people who are down in the trenches trying to figure out what is going on. He also makes the pizza run. He gets the pizza, he gets the Mountain Dew, he gets the Cokes, he gets the Starbucks. They keep the people who are down there at the terminals, consoles, whatever, fueled and going. Okay. The lead investigator, and there, are all, there, there may be subordinate lead investigators, but these are the people leading the actual looking into what is going on. Do we have a compromise? Is it network? Was it somebody internal looking at the, you know, looking at things that they shouldn't be doing? Was this the result of spear phishing? Did somebody go to a compromised website and download malware? They're working on that. The response team leaders, um, members, sorry, members. These are these are the the very low level people working away trying to determine what happened. Those five W's plus one H. Okay. Um, a very important member of the team is this documentation and timeline leader. They are with pen and notebook writing down who did what when. This is very important because if the incident has to go to court or some sort of administrative action, those records are extremely important. Now one thing to talk about on this is notice that it says timeline leader. They're time stamping what happened when. What's the source of that time? Is it the time on the computer that they're investigating? No. That may have been compromised. You don't want to use that. Is it their watch? Probably not. That's not real good either. Is it the one on the wall? Probably not that good either. It turns out the time on your cell phone is very, very accurate. When my wife and I have our, have our cell phones set to go off at the same time, they go off immediately at exactly the same point in time. Cell phone time is extremely accurate because the cell phone companies have to charge for time and they want every nickel they can get so the clocks are very accurate. So, use the cell phone time. Um, let's say that your, your team is investigating an incident and they find something that is of criminal nature. This may be stealing PII, personally identifiable information, trade secrets. At that point, do you call the police? No. This is where HR and legal come in. If you suspect criminal actions, that is where you call legal and HR and say, hi, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> they can get in, they know how to deal with this, they can call the FBI or the local police or whatever. That is their job, they can handle it. Okay. There are frequently other parties involved in the incidents response team. Now I have up there upper management. This is sometimes called the stakeholders. These are people who have a real interest in, in things. Um, for instance, the users of the systems. The Chief Information Security Officer, the CISO. He needs to be informed of this. The CIO, the Chief Information Officer. Now, where I work, we have our own counterintelligence office. You may have one, you may not. They may need to be informed. Physical security. And finally, law enforcement. So, Question. yes, sir. For those of us that don't have legal departments and <coughs> HR departments, mm -hmm. um, you detect something that's a criminal intent. Mm -hmm. 
too bad for us. Huh? No, no. At, at that point, the, the best recommendation I can get you, I can offer for you, contact a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Because you, you will need to protect yourself. And a lawyer is the best way to do that. To make sure that you're not doing something that you shouldn't. Yes, sir. I kind of have a follow-up to this. So there's uh, large companies out there. I found uh, child pornography on a large company uh, website and reported it. And two years later, it's still up. I tried law enforcement. I don't have money for lawyers. What's the problem? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that if you if you found child pornography on something like that. So Cloudflare is the, uh, pardon? It's a CDN called Cloudflare, which is like they protect DDoS attacks mm -hmm. against people. Very um, large company and they have child pornography flowing over their network constantly. Two years uh, later it's still up. Um, it may be that they don't want to admit it <laughs> yes. because if and they do I have talked to the CEO of Cloudflare and that's they hung up on me mm -hmm. and laughed. They, they may, that is very likely that they don't want to admit it because they don't want the FBI coming in there and seizing all of their disk drives. Oh, I'd love that. Mm -hmm. That, that is, <laughs> yeah, that is the usual uh, modus operandi when something like that happens is that the FBI comes in and they haul away all of your disk drives. I agree totally. Um, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, that's who's in. Yes, sir. Just a quick one. Yeah. Barring a lawyer, if someone just wanted to educate themselves on the laws around this sort of thing, are there any good resources for that? On incident response or legal responsibility? Legal responsibility kind of things. I don't know of any right offhand. Um, but um, if you... If it in, if in any way it involved, but but uh, from having had some classes on digital forensics and the law, if you find pornography, take your hands away and call the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly child pornography. Yeah, the police at that point, yeah. at that point, <laughs> take your hands off, walk away, and call some and call a law enforcement official. Yes, sir. The key thing is to preserve the evidence. You don't want to have to mess with the, the hard drive, or whatever. But they'll seize it and they'll use that as, a, as the evidence mm -hmm. for court. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's why I say, in, in a situation like that, walk away from it and don't touch it because you you don't want. Uh, I, I I in a digital forensics class that I had and the law. Um, the instructor was talking about a, a situation when he was fairly young in the digital forensics um, game, and he found evidence of child pornography on a computer. So he put it into an archive and he sent it and he emailed it off to uh, a law enforcement officer that he knew. Well, that was not the thing to do um, you, because. The, the law enforcement officer said, don't ever do this again because that has the appearance of trafficking and child pornography and you don't want to do this at all. If you see this, if you find this sort of thing, hands off, call law enforcement. Okay. Um, but yeah. Um, Google is your friend. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there that you can find something out there. That's what I would do if I were I were uncertain. Um, okay. Um, Incident response procedures. What's the difference between a process and a procedure? It's kind of splitting hairs a little bit, but. Um, the difference is, is that process is the whole incident response thing from start to finish. Procedures are what go into making incident response work. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but that's basically the idea. You have procedures that go into the process. And we kind of use them interchangeably, but um, we shouldn't. Okay. There. I talk about it there. Um, well, one of the topics that I had in there was about lessons that we can learn from the military in instance response. We've already got a lot of military type terms in computer science and cybersecurity. DMZ, demilitarized zone. We had that in between North Korea and South Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, um, and we have it <coughs> between our web presence and our internal systems. Command and control, CNC. Um, that has become a big buzzword much more lately because now that describes when uh, Fred and Accounting's PC has been compromised, and now it's talking out to a server in Lower Slobovia that's giving it commands to do. That's where we get the CNC. Another one comes from the Air Force, and it's called the OODA loop. OODA, O-O-D-A. And it was came up by a fellow named John Boyd. This is what they teach fighter pilots. They really do teach fighter pilots this. UDA stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. That's what they tell fighter pilots to do. When you're in a dogfight, observe the situation. Orient yourself with regard to where your wingman is. Where are the enemy pilots? Where are they coming from? Where are they going to? Once you've got yourself oriented, also oriented, or orienting in terms of being a fighter pilot is, am I flying upside down? Am I flying right side up? That's also important. Decide. Once you've got, once you've observed the situation, oriented yourself, decide what you're going to do. What are my options to do? And then, once you've decided on what you're going to do, do it. It sounds real simple, but it works for fighter pilots. It also works in instance response. So, um, observing. The tools for observing. Log analysis. Everybody's got logs. Funnel them into a centralized point. Use some sort of log analysis program to look at those logs. Make sure it is somebody's job to look at those logs. You wouldn't secure the perimeter of, say, an office complex or a campus or something. Put up fences and then put up cameras. Have those cameras all coming into a bunch of screens. And then having nobody watch those screens for somebody coming over the fence? No. <coughs> Same thing with log analysis. Somebody needs to be looking at the logs, and it needs to be their job. IDS alerts, intrusion detection systems. That's another important thing to be looking at. Is somebody trying to get in using some sort of HTTP compromise? Traffic analysis. Do we have traffic going to places that we don't ordinarily go to? Like Fred's PC in Lower Slobovia, going to Lower Slobovia. NetFlow. NetFlow will tell us the amount of traffic that is going, because if we suddenly get, let's say, we get a large amount of DNS traffic all of a sudden. Now, generally speaking, DNS is small stuff out, big stuff back. If you see DNS going the other way around, where it's small stuff coming in, big stuff going out, that lets you know that somebody's been compromised and they're using DNS to encapsulate the traffic to get around any observation. 
Also, just good old performance monitoring tools. Top. I.O. stat. Is something suddenly consuming more CPU than it does, shouldn't ordinarily. What's normal for your system? Is something abnormally happening? Remember before I was talking about the things in incidence response? Commonality, the common denominators, common exceptions. If you're seeing anomalous traffic, that's that common exceptions. And how can I fine tune it? The idea is that the more things you can observe, the better off you will be. Now, quite honestly, that, that sounds real good, but you can, and this happens a lot, have too much information, and your incidence response team can just be flooded in stuff, and they're going, I have the foggiest notion what this stuff, what, what's going on. So, yes, you can have too much information, but having too much and having to wade through it is probably a lot better than having no information and not being able to have any idea of what is going on. In, the, in orientation, when you're trying to orient yourself, triage. Triage is basically three things uh, as far as doctors go. Are they not hurt enough that I need to do anything about? Are they hurt so bad that nothing I can do will make things better? Are they hurt enough that I can do something about? That's that looking, that looking of things. Threat intelligence, that's a new, another new buzzword, but threat intelligence is um, and looking for things that are going to be harmful in your environment. Um, there are plenty of open source, free, threat intelligence feeds that you can get. For instance, um, Alien Vault, who recently got it, uh, sucked up by AT&T. Um, they provide a free in intelligence briefing. Um, there are several others, others. Do your own security research. Look into things. Um, that is something that I do very frequently. Very importantly, know your enemy. If you can decide, look at your organization and see what are the resources that an attacker would most likely be interested in getting. Now, um, for instance, I take care of supercomputers, very large supercomputers, for their cybersecurity. I know what the attackers are after. They're after cheap, easy, free compute cycles. That's what I look for. Um, if you are a bank, they're looking at stealing credit card numbers. If you're a retailer, they're looking at stealing credit card company credit card numbers. If you're a pharmaceutical company, they're looking to find your formulations. If you're a toy company, they're looking to find what toys you might be bringing out for Christmas. Know your enemy. Know what they're looking for. Okay. On the decide portion, you've made the observations, you've got the context. Now it's time to look at what, what is your damage, what is your recovery. Your tools that you're going to use in this are your, your company's security plan. And hopefully you do have a security plan. I've written those, yes. Um, Remember I talked about the timekeeper and the documentation leader? Notebook, pen, clock. Um, one of the things that um, you will sometimes see in incidence response is talking about the incidence response go bag. When I used to be a, a roving consultant for a, for a hardware vendor, um, I would sometimes come in at 8 o'clock and be up on an airplane at noon to a company site. So about the second after this happened more than twice, I produced a little go bag. Actually, it was a go suitcase that had everything that I needed, like a coat, a suit coat, shirt, tie, pants, underwear, 
toiletries, all that, um, plus what I would need to take to a job site, media, um, pen and paper, all those sorts of things. That goes into your tools. Um, ask yourself, what's the best thing I can do based on the facts? That is a very important question to ask because that will drive your solution to, the, to your incident. Finally, there's ACT. Remediate, recover, improve response procedures based on your lessons learned. Um, now, in, in some cases, uh, when people do this step, they ACT, um, say it's a server, say it's a, a laptop, a desktop server, they put a fresh image on it. Okay, that's great. You've just refreshed it, and the problem causing software or configuration is still there. You didn't do this part, the lessons learned. You didn't go back and patch your golden image so that you don't have a repetition of it. Tools in this, data capture, forensic analysis tools, um, you may need to make a disk image for further use. You may be using forensic tools like Autopsy or the Sleuth Kit or Encase or Forensic Toolkit. Um, uh, there's lots of them out there, some free, some not. Backups. Backups are very important. Let's say that you get hit by ransomware. Yeah, ransomware, bad stuff. Ransomware is not new. It's just extortion with a different set of clothes. The Mafia knows all about extortion. Um, one recent case I remember, City of Atlanta got hit up. They forked out something like $100,000 in Bitcoins. Um, those are the tools. And finally, Fred, over in accounting, who clicked on the link that he shouldn't have, security awareness training. Fred, don't click on stuff that looks dubious. Just because they say your email has been compromised and you need to enter your username and password and your social security number and where you live and three major credit cards. No, don't, don't do that. Um, fine tuning is one of the most important things you can do. Because after you have cleaned everything up, you want to make sure that this isn't going to happen. Communication and this continuous improvement are very important. When we get into an incident response situation, we have the fog of war. Um, everybody's running around with their hair on fire. The CIO, the CISO, they're wanting to know what's going on. Is this going to be a huge financial loss for the company? Have we lost 14 million credit cards? Our new formulation for our chili surprise, has that been compromised? Do they have that? Keep calm. Don't run around with your hair on fire. Um, I particularly like this one. There is no I in team, but there is in friction. Um, when you're doing incident response, remember, this is a team sport. You're working with other people, you need to talk to them, they need to talk to you. That is very important to be able to carry out an effective incidence response. They need to, they, uh, and if, you're, or if you have the position of being the lead on the incident, you're going to be talking to higher ups, you're going to be talking to people to lower down. Okay. Um, NIST. National Institutes for Standards and Technology. They used to be called Bureau of Standards, but, and they publish a lot of very good open source documents on computer security, and this is one that I'm familiar with. Special Publication 861, which describes the six main steps in incidence response. Um, this is free. You can go out and get it off of the off of the NIST site, um, and there are some slightly different names for these six main phases. But this is what they are: preparation, 
identification, <coughs> containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. Question for you. Which one of these six phases do you end up spending the most time? Lessons learned. Preparation. Preparation, yes. It may seem like the other five you spend the most amount of time, but that's the fog of war telling you that time is now expanded up. Preparation is the most important thing to do because the more you prepare, the less time you'll be spending on these other five. But a lot of people don't do that. Talk about each one briefly. Preparing for the potential incident. Not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And it will happen eventually. Preparation is a continuous process. It is not something that you just do. You do not just write your incident response plan and your security plan, put them on the shelf, and say, well, okay, job done. No, it doesn't work that way. You must continually look at your incident response plan and your security plan. Refine them, make them better. Um, there are plenty of free examples out there on the web. You need to review these documents at some periodic level. I have to review mine once a year. I have to do that, and I have to show that I have reviewed it. Um, but um, preparation is, is key, because the more time you spend preparing, the less time you'll spend doing these others. Identification. This is gathering information about the potential incidents that you may have. <coughs> These are the questions you need to ask if you have an incident. Do we watch and learn or do we pull the plug? Old school. Used to be you had an incident, pull the plug right away. Poof, gone. That's it. Game over. It's not what we do now. Now we look to see if we have bad guys in the systems, what are they doing? What are they after? Try to learn what they're doing. And if we are watching, we need to decide how long do we watch. Who makes these kinds of decisions? Does your lead on the instance response make these kinds of decisions? No. This is a decision that the CISO makes. He decides whether or not you pull the plug and how long you may want to look at what is going on. Okay. Containment. Containment is isolating the systems that are affected. And this is dependent on the kind of incident. Um, if, for instance, say you have um, somebody beating on your firewall 10,000 times a minute trying to get in. That requires a dip one kind of containment. If you have, on the other hand, malware that is spreading through your internal network, that requires a different kind of containment. You might want to go to a router and segment off those machines or that whole subnet that's being affected. Um, very important question. It goes back to, do I watch or do I cut them off the knees? How long do we risk continuing operation? This is, again, not something that the lead of the incident response team does. This is something that the CIO and the CISO decide. Volatile data, what's on your system, memory, disks, save those for future analysis because you may need to do some kind of administrative action or you may need to do some kind of criminal action. Once you've got things contained, you get rid of the attackers. Seems pretty simple. Once you've got them all taken care of, you've reloaded the uh, OS on the affected PCs, you've uh, got the backup tapes and restored the data from your database. Has the environment been hardened so that we don't have to do this again? 
redo your golden discs, redo your golden images, put the patches in that hopefully you should have put in in the beginning. Um, this is what happened to Experian. They were running a version of Apache and they hadn't updated, made any updates in six months, so they got compromised pretty easily. Um, I was talking with someone this morning and there are, there are three big credit agencies. There's TransUnion, there's Experian, and we couldn't think of the third one. But yeah, I don't know how... Pardon? Equifax. Equifax, that's it, yeah. Thank you. I, um, I don't know how, how well Experian is going to recover from this. Um, okay. You're down, down to the fifth element in the six of instance response phases. You now need to ask the question, do we see this again? Are we seeing this again? If it is, go back, start over, run through the loop again. And of course, make sure that you've taken care of the problem in the first place. This one has different names, but lessons learned. You need to hold this one, this meeting, where you get all the interested parties in a room while the information in their brain is still fresh and say, okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What can we do better? And put that back into your instance response plan and your security plan. And of course, since you have to deal with upper management, is management sufficiently happy that this incident has been closed? Hopefully the answer is yes. Um, talked about the cyber kill chain. What techniques do the attackers use to get in? Um, there are various stages in that. And the first one Reconnaissance and probing. This is sometimes called OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. There is a tremendous amount of information that you can find out about somebody working at a company that you may want to break into. For instance, Facebook, Twitter. Somebody posts on their Facebook page, oh, you know, I work at XYZ Corporation, I'm going to go on vacation for two weeks. Well, this is great news for somebody who wants to compromise the system because now they know where they work. From that, they can probably guess an email address. And now they can do a phishing exercise, mailing off to parties say, hey, you know, I'm off in Hawaii and I got this call that I need to log in and um, check some email but I can't get in. Can you reset my password for me? Oops. Yes. Reconnaissance and probing. Then once they've got the information that they need, say they just have an inf uh, they've done some trolling and found out your email address from where you work. Now what they're going to do is they're probably going to send you some sort of phishing email to spike your interest. This is social engineering. There's lots of ways to do social engineering, but um, something I, I believe I've seen that the one statistic says 75% of compromises are due to phishing. It's a very popular technique. Then. Once they've gotten in, they've delivered malware, they're going to elevate their privileges, hopefully, they're going to cover their tracks, they're going to get rid of log information, and then they're going to pivot to other systems in the network. They're going to start branching out. This is also called lateral movement. They're trying to find more and more information about your network, and frequently, the bad guys know more about your network than you do. Lather, rinse, repeat. 
This is the cycle that they're going through. Then they have the system compromise. They're going to steal your comp steal computing resources. They're going to be looking for data that they can use, techniques to exfiltrate. Uh, remember I talked about DNS? That's a favorite one these days. Okay. Um, now, what kind of incidence response types can we have and what kind of actions can you do? So, nice little chart here. Incidence response types, for instance, port scanning activity. That's reconnaissance and probing. That's kind of low priority. That happens all the time. I see that stuff all the time on my stuff. Um, you could ignore these unless it's something really relevant. Um, distributed denial of service. Some there, there are lots of dark net businesses that will sell you DDoS bots forever how many you want to have. 100, 200, 300, very low prices too, to do distributed denial of service. Others. Um, that, den that distributed denial of service, that may not be just they want to take you offline. That may be to cover up some other action that they're trying to do. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Um, insider breach. This is a lot more of a problem than we really like to admit because we've allowed somebody in and we think they're okay. But a lot of problems come from insiders. Um, Joe over in accounting. He didn't get the raise that he thought he should. So now he's stealing some information from uh, inside of R&D, and he's going to sell it to a competitor. That happens more than we really like to admit. Um, uh, what's a good one here? Um, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, there, are, there are lots of APT characters out there in the world. Um, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, um, they are after any number of things. Um, they're after getting in your systems, they're after stealing your, uh, in, in the case of China in particular, they're in, interested in stealing any kind of technology information that they can get. Um, and let's see, finally, false alarms. Well, gee, sometimes that happens. Um, remember the OODA loop I talked about? What are tools for doing the OODA loop? An instance response. Okay. Observe. Talked a little bit about log analysis. Your intrusion detection systems. Vulnerability scanners, such as OpenVest, Nikto, Wikto, SquealMap, WebSecureFi, Samurai. Monitoring and alerting. Nagios. Good old Nagios, Zabbix, OMD, a new one, Sensa, and um, Achinga. Web proxies, Squid, Paras. For orienting, send map and end map for finding an inventory of what your stuff is. Yes, sir? Uh, regarding logging people's or not event data, how can we keep the balance between privacy and security? Um, <laughs> that's a hard problem. Um, that's where that's where HR and legal come in. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, what what tools do you use to observe or detect lateral movement? Um, actually, that one is kind of on the next slide. Um, yeah. I need bots. Pardon? I need bots. 
Um, so well, that yeah, that, that that's one. That, that's a possibility, but um, as Hercule Poirot would say, use your little gray cells. Use your brain. Look at stuff. Do you see, remember I talked about common denominators and common exceptions? Um, if Fred, over in accounting, is suddenly looking, doing stuff, uh, uh, logging into systems in R&D, that's unusual. Um, are you now going out to websites that you don't ordinarily go to? Do you have anomalies in your traffic? That's the sort of stuff you can look for, and that's not really automatable. Uh, that needs to be somebody's uh, job, and that's usually a portion of incident response, but Sometimes some people, some organizations, actually delegate that out to a threat hunting branch of the organization. That is what their job is, is to look for that kind of stuff and head it off. Um, to some extent, that's what our counterintelligence group at uh, where I work does. That's one of the things they look into. But they're looking for things that are out of the ordinary, those anomalous things. There are off-the-shelf products you can buy that do anomaly detection, um, but uh, the, the best way is still, like Hercule Poirot, Hercule Poirot says, use your little gray cells. Look for this stuff. Yes, sir? You, you did a talk a few years ago about basically analysis of logs. It was just great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, log analysis is great. Um, learning Part of that log analysis thing is learning what is normal for your system. Um, if, if I come in on Monday mor morning and I look at what I have seen, what's been happening over the weekend, um, if I see um, a big spike on some port I don't ordinarily see, like um, recently I walked in and there was a lot of activity on port, TCP port, mm, it was like 9435. Well, that's weird. Where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from a lot of different places. But it's all occurring over this same time period. What's special about 9435? Did some research. What it was is that is a port used for debugging certain IoT cameras. What, what somebody was doing was they had a botnet and they were looking to see if there were any of these uh, IoT cameras on my outside network so that they could take them over. That's, that's the kind of anomalous behavior that you can detect. Um, just simple histogram charts or line charts can give you really good information about this kind of thing. And, and net flow data. Um, most any good router or switch these days that you can buy, even the cheapy ones, um, you can get, they have a, what's sometimes called a span port. You can, that, that will give you net flow data, which is sort of like a Reader's Digest condensed version of the data that's been going. It'll show who it's coming from, who it's going to, amount and time. And with that information, you can see if somebody, if you're going to places that you don't ordinarily go to, or you have a high volume of traffic to a particular place that you don't ordinarily go to. Or, by the same token, a large amount of traffic coming in from somewhere that you don't ordinarily see. Um, acting. Um, now you're into the more or less the forensics part of it, where you're trying to answer those five W questions plus one H. The SANS SIF security kit is a, a good open source um, set of tools for doing forensics. Sleuth kit is if you're into command line. Autopsy, which is a nice GUI on top of the sleuth kit for doing analysis. Backup stuff. Um, the SAN security program on securing the human so that they don't 
click on on things um, <laughs> that they shouldn't have. Okay. Um, attribution is frequently a, a big part of incidence response. Where are these IP? Where where, where are these IP addresses located? Um, anybody take geography in grade school? Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody think it was a lame class? Yeah, I thought it was a lame class too until I started having things on the internet. Um, one time I uh, was looking at a GOIP map of where I was getting a lot of traffic from. And here's this big red dot in the middle of the Indian Ocean. No, no, this is wrong. There is nothing in the middle of the Indian Ocean except for Madagascar, and that's that's a private game. That's a private reserve by international law. So, but it's just out there in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I'm going, no, this can't be right. So I started doing looking where these IP addresses are coming from. There's a little island out there in the middle of the Indian Ocean called the Seychelles Island, and they love to do port scans. I, I it's just amazing. But yeah. Um, yeah, once you start worrying about where stuff is coming from on the internet, geography becomes a very important subject, even if you thought it was lame in, high, in, in, in grade school. I think the biggest issue with that is you can actually spoof the source address. So oh, yeah. It could be like in Russia, but pretend I'm coming from China. Oh, yeah, that, that is so entirely that's possible. Easy, that's, easy, why easy, say, easy. that's why I say attribution is, a t is, is very difficult. But a lot of times it's not that complicated. Um, Hopefully, IPv6 will fix that issue. I'm not going to live long enough to see IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't care. It, it's it's a nice idea, and it was probably a uh, a wonderful idea when it was conceived of back in the 70s. But uh, it's been 40 years later, and yeah. right. Anyway, um, <laughs> attribution. Where are these IP addresses are coming from? Uh, Maxmine. Um, they are the, the standard for taking a geolocation and turning, for, for taking an IP address and turning it into a geolocation. Um, they make a free database that you can download that up, is updated once a month. And it will get you down to the city level. It's that good, for free. Um, if you go out to their website, you can stick in an IP address and it will tell you give you a geolocation. It will also tell you a uh, uh, host name. It will tell you where it's located uh, in, inside a city. Um, it will tell you who the ISP is, if, if it can. That can be very helpful. Um, but they limit the number of times that you can do this in like a day. You can do like 20 in a day. Uh, IPTracker.org is free. Tells you the same information, but you can do it in an, an, an unlimited number of times. Um, um, another project, abuse, IP, DB, same sort of thing. You can get information about um, where things are coming, where things are going. In summary, Incidence response doesn't have to be a bad fire drill. It can be, it's not going to be a pleasant experience, but it doesn't be, have to be like going to the dentist and getting five root canals. Um, the incidence response tram, well, that's great. <laughs> I guess that's what the incidence response rides around on, is they ride around on the incidence response tram. Incidence response team. Create the team before the incidence response is needed. There are six steps in incidence response. Preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. The more you prepare, the less you'll have to the less time you'll have to spend on the other five. And always make sure you do the last one, the lessons learned. That is very important. Use the OODA loop to scope out the situation. Observe, orient, decide, act. And some references. 
NIST Special Publication 862, uh, 861, that's on incidents response. Um, a good site, the new school of security for that. SANS incidents response checklist. Forms that you need to fill out when you're doing incidents response. Um, Lockheed Martin, the aircraft company, they came up with this idea of the cyber kill chain, and they have a video of it. It's a nice one. Be sure and check it out if you have the time. Um, another NIST special publication that I have to deal with a lot in my job. Special publication 853. 853 spells out the security controls that you need to do for a low security system, a medium security system, and a high security system. It is a very thorough document, and of course, it is free. If you're interested in OODA, there's where you can find about the OODA loop. And another NIST pu uh, special publication that is very good is how you can weave forensic procedures into your incident response. How to do that. Again, that is free. Um, if you're interested in my slides, send me an email. I'll send them to you. That's all I have. Thank you. Questions? Answers? Great proof?